Good morning, Meadowbrook. Ooh, I have a booming voice this morning. That's great. Well, I grew up with a mother who was a school teacher. She's somewhere in this room this morning. I don't know where she is, but it meant that many nights of the week, if you're a school teacher or you know someone who is, you'd come home and she would have to be grading papers. And so usually you put something on in the background while you're doing that kind of work, just something to kind of fill out white noise. And for me, we started to learn pretty quickly what some of my mother's favorite movies are. And probably at the very, very top of her list, what she watched more than maybe anything else, other than Rudy, let's be honest, that's a great one, was the movie, What About Bob? Anybody seen that movie? Yeah, okay. Seems like maybe 90% of the people in here have. If you are 25 or younger, maybe you haven't seen it, uh, or maybe you have. But it's a great movie, right? It's this hilarious movie. What about Bob? It's a 1991 comedy starring Bill Murray, who plays the role of Bob Wiley. He's this, like, mentally unstable patient who suffers from many uh, phobias. He lives in this small New York City apartment. He never really comes out of the apartment unless he absolutely needs to. Um, And the other character is Richard Dreyfuss, who plays the role of Dr. Leo Marvin, who is a psychotherapist that has this blossoming career that's filled with notoriety. I mean, he's starting to write books. He's got this book called Baby Steps that's really speaking to Bob uh, deeply. Uh, So he's got a publishing deal. He's even got an appearance on Good Morning America. And so Dr. Leo Marvin's life is this, like, well-ordered, accomplished thing He's got a beautiful family. He's got a beautiful home life. He's paid his dues. He's earned his degrees. And his life is finally at a place where he can go ahead and buy a lake home for his family. So he does that. He's got this just kind of perfect life that he's entering into. He's finally experiencing the good life. But all of that is put into jeopardy when he takes on Bob Wiley as a client because Bob's psychological quirks cause him to not really get that there's a division between like a personal life and a professional life, right? Bob doesn't get that at all. Bob's already burned through one therapist who was really happy to give him uh, over to to Dr. Marvin. And um, Marvin, he quickly begins to experience these many extreme ways in which Bob inserts himself into his life. And so First, Bob tries to get Dr. Is that the photo of the... Yeah, he's sailing. He sails. Uh, it's a great part of the movie. First, Bob tries to get his phone number so he can keep in touch with Dr. Marvin while he's gone on this month-long vacation. That doesn't work, so then he pays somebody to impersonate Dr. Marvin's sister. That doesn't work for getting his phone number. And when that doesn't work, Bob, uh, he impersonates a homicide detective... He goes into the doctor's office and and he tells Leo's co-workers that Bob has died and he'll need to get Dr. Marvin's phone number so that he can contact him and tell him. And so Bob's not just quirky, but he's actually pathological, right? He's totally extreme. He's totally wild. And as a sane person watching the movie, it makes you relate to Leo Marvin quite a bit, to the doctor quite a bit, because he's obviously the good guy. And Bob is the one with the big issues. But as the film continues, Bob shows up at the lake house all of a sudden. He inserts himself into Dr. Marvin's family vacation. And the problem is that Dr. Marvin's family absolutely loves Bob. They love him. They love him. Bob Bob is fun, whereas Dr. Marvin is totally grouchy. Bob is free and alive, whereas Leo Marvin seems to only see the negative side of everything. Apparently, by the way, they hated each other when they were filming this, just as a kind of side note. So it really was this dynamic that was happening. Dr. Marvin is even aggressive at one point. He he pushes Bob off of the dock into the lake, which only makes his family love Bob more and feel even, even worse for Bob. And Bob does one thing after another throughout the movie, all of which are somewhat crazy But somehow Dr. Marvin ends up being the bad guy in all of these situations. And again, as a rational viewer of the film, you kind of feel for him, for Dr. Marvin, because he's not wrong, because it's Bob that has the issues, right? Bob is the one who has the issues. But the thing about Bob's issues is that they're so innocent, and they're so genuine that it makes him likable. 
And it's Dr. Marvin who turns into this unlikable guy as the film goes on. And at one point, Good Morning America comes out to the lake house to film, and they're on site to talk about his new book, Baby Steps, and Bob somehow finds him, himself in the interview, and he humiliates Dr. Marvin on national TV, and it's Bob who ends up looking like the good one. And so in the end, Dr. Marvin gets so frustrated, so disjointed, so unnerved, he attempts to kill Bob, and Dr. Marvin ends up losing his mental faculties, and ironically, he's sent to a mental institution, while Bob ends up marrying his wife and moving in with the family and, and enjoying all of the many things that Dr. Marvin once had. It's absurd, right? It's an absurd movie. It's hilarious. It's exhausting. I feel exhausted having to describe that <laughs> in three or four minutes. It's one of those upside down kind of movies that leaves most of us imagining like, what would I do if I were in Dr. Marvin's shoes? That's what I, that's, I get very like pulled in emotionally to movies. That's how I feel when I watch that movie. I was like, gosh, what would I do if this was happening to me? Because he's worked so hard. You know, he's worked hard, he's studied hard, he's made successful career choices for himself. Uh, and all of it is threatened by this one client who has the potential to destroy everything that he's worked for. And so the question for Dr. Marvin would be, is this relationship with Bob really worth the cost? Is it really worth the cost to have this relationship with Bob? Now, I doubt that any of us in this room have had a relationship with someone quite like that, although maybe a few of us in this room have had a relationship with someone as extreme as that. Uh, so maybe it's not a Bob Wiley, but I bet you you've had an experience with someone or with something that seems okay at first, but as time goes on, you kind of realize that it has the potential to dismantle everything you've worked so hard to earn and accomplish in your life. Maybe, maybe you've ex experienced that. And when we think of relationships or things that have the potential to tear our lives apart, we usually think of negative things, right? Right? So it might be like an in-law that just keeps inserting themselves into your life in, in kind of stepping over the boundaries of your life in unhealthy ways. Or it could be a neighbor who isn't just unpleasant, but who's destructive, who's vindictive, right? It, it could be a reckless child who's making all kinds of destructive choices, and it's impacting your family's life, too. It's not just impacting their life, but the family, too. Or it could be a job that started at 40 hours a week, but now you find yourself working 50, 60, 70, maybe even 80 hours a week, right? And it's threatening to destroy your life. Or it could be just like a small gambling habit, right? That just started as this small, I'm just going to put 10 bucks on the Packers game. And now it's kind of evolved into a much, much bigger thing. And all of a sudden, your bank account looks very different, right? And it's kind of out of control. There's so many negative things that should cause us to pause and ask the question of whether our relationship with those things is worth the cost, right? Is it really worth the cost in those situations? But I want us to pause and consider that maybe it's not just negative things in our lives that have the potential to disrupt our lives, but also positive things. Have you ever thought of that? The positive things also can disrupt our lives as well. In fact, if you zoom out from your own life and you consider the world at large, think about it. Why are wars not solved quickly by a peace movement? Why do most peace movements take a long, long time to work? Why does war just keep on going on? Or why, why are people so needlessly taken advantage of? Why, don't, why aren't the good people who are working in communities, why aren't, isn't this positive force working? Or why is there so much resistance to peace movements like those of MLK Jr. or those of Gandhi in India? Right? Like, why is there so much resistance to these movements? We as people push against negative things in our life, and that makes sense, as we should. But the difficult reality to face is that sometimes we also push against the positive things in life as well. And maybe you don't do it all the time, but we as humanity do it all the time. It's happening all over our world all the time, because transformation, whether it be from a good place or a bad place, always comes at a cost. It's always going to cost us something, whether that cost is good or bad. And that's exactly 
what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 15. So if you're there, uh, go ahead and, and um, look at verses 18 to 25 of John chapter 15. If you're not there, go ahead and open your Bibles up. Um, we've been in this place where Jesus is sitting down around a table and he's sharing a meal with his disciples. This is prior to when he's going to be arrested. And so it's in this d discourse during the Lord's Supper that Jesus says many things, but he promises them, his disciples, the presence of his Holy Spirit. So if you go back just a chapter or two, he promises the gift of the Spirit that will come to the disciples, and he says that the Spirit will teach the disciples all things, and that the Spirit will remind his disciples of everything he said. He's going to come into their life and remind them of everything that he said. And, and the way that it's going to do this is by keeping them connected to Jesus in every moment of their lives and in every moment of our lives. And he uses this great image of the vine and the branches with the point being that he's the vine and we are the branches. And so the way we are to operate in the world is through remaining connected to Jesus. That's what that passage is all about, being connected to him. That's how you bear fruit in your life is by being connected to Jesus. And so what does that mean? Well, he tells us in verse 17. So this is right before our passage. He says, Jesus finishes this whole discourse by saying, this is my command, love each other. It's really simple. Love each other. And he follows it up immediately with this next phrase. Now, just look at the, how different these, these things are. He says, love each other. And then he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Love each other, but the world's going to hate you. The world's going to hate you. Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. God's love, this is our first point for this morning, it's just simple, that God's love incites the world's Hatred. Why is it that this, this good, loving movement of Jesus, this perfectly loving movement of Jesus, incites the world's hatred? Why is there such push, pushback against it? We see this dynamic in Jesus' teaching, that his nature is love itself. But it's interesting to notice just how much opposition love really does have in our world. We would think that if you could actually imagine a political leader who, who embodied love, like 100% love for humanity. We would think that if we had a political leader like that, um, that we would, that sort of a leader would have full support in our world. That's what we think. We would think that all movements that fight for justice and equality and for love would all be universally supported and championed in our world. Doesn't that just make sense? Like, who would be against such a movement? But the problem with every human movement or agenda is that it's never fully pure, right? Like, even MLK Jr. had his problems. Abraham Lincoln had plenty of problems. It, 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 was, it was a movement built on love, but there was always a human element mixed into it. And so it's mostly love, but with some selfish ambition mixed in, with some selfish motive blended into it, which makes Jesus' life, his message and his ministry and his actions so unique. It's so unique because it, it gives us a window into what it would look like if we had a perfect leader in charge. What would happen? How would the world act? How would they respond to a perfect leader if they could see pure, unadulterated love? It's beautiful. And when we read the Gospels, we're seeing what it would look like. This is what it would look like. And what's the world's response to this love? It hates it. That's Jesus' first point to us this morning. It actually hates it. Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Now, now, what does Jesus mean when he says the world? Because on the one hand, you could kind of see this as a person who sees himself cornered. Like he can see he's about to be arrested and he's starting to get paranoid. Right? Some commentators, biblical commentators, have even said this as they're reading it. They're saying, is Jesus just paranoid about himself? And he's saying, the whole world is against me, the world's against my disciples, and I'm warning you. But I don't think that's what's happening here. 
I don't think that's what he's pointing out. I don't think Jesus is paranoid. He's actually quite calm in this situation. So what does he mean when he talks about the world? Because certainly not the whole entire world has rejected him. Some people have followed him. Some people have listened to him. Well, this term, the world, it's a Greek term, cosmos, which should, should sound familiar, right? Because we have our English word cosmos, right? When we think about the cosmos, we think about all the stars that are out there. We think about the universe. We think about planets, stars, solar systems. And the Greek term can refer to that, but more practically, it refers to government and politics and the crowds and the masses that are living, the people that are living in the world. It's a really, really broad term. In fact, it's a term that John absolutely loves. He uses this term 65 times in the book of John. It's all over the place. You can hardly go more than a couple paragraphs without John saying something about the world, right? And it can be used in three different ways. It can be used in a really positive way. So think first and foremost of John 3.16, right? For God so loved the, the world, the cosmos, right? He, he loves the world. It, it's not a way of saying that, that uh, G, God loved everything that the world did, that God loved all of the sin, all of the, the hurt and the hatred that the world lived out. It's actually just a way of talking about how powerful God's love, love is, right? His love is so much that he loves the people of the world. So it can sometimes be used in that positive way. So, sometimes it's used in a more neutral way, kind of a fun verse. It's at the end of John in, in chapter 21, where John says that if everything Jesus did was written down, he supposes that the whole world wouldn't have enough room for all the books that would be written, right? It's just a way of talking about kind of geographical space. But it's most often used in the book of John in a negative kind of way. Like in John chapter 1, right at the beginning, in verse 10, when it says that Jesus was in the world and the world was made through him, but the world did not recognize him. So it's actually using that term in a couple different ways. It's saying the geographical world, our physical space was actually made through Jesus, and the masses of people were made through him and for him, and yet when he came to them, they didn't recognize him at all. It's a world that operates on its own agenda without acknowledging God. It's a world that John says repeatedly throughout his gospel is in the dark. It's a world in the dark. And every time I get up here and talk about John's gospel, I have to mention, he keeps mentioning light and dark over and over. People who are in the dark, people who are in the light, which is why when Nicodemus comes to him, to Jesus in chapter 3, he's a religious leader, but he's in the dark. It's why when the woman at the well comes to Jesus in chapter 4, she's a sinful woman, but she's in the light. She comes in broad daylight. John says, the world that, into which Jesus came to save sits in darkness. In fact, it loves darkness. Does that sound true about the world in which you live? Does that sound true about your own heart, even? Do you love darkness? In John 3, it says this. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light. They will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. And so into this context, Jesus says to his disciples, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't be surprised at all if the world hates you, for keep in mind that it hated me First, in a world that is so accustomed to darkness, it will take offense at the light. It will always take offense at the light. Or in a world that profits from sin, in a world that profits from darkness, a movement of pure love will be seen as a threat. You know, I mentioned Abraham Lincoln before. I recently read a biography on Lincoln, and it was eye-opening for so many reasons, but I think the most eye-opening thing because you kind of learn about the Civil War when you're going through school a little bit. Some of you history buffs know a lot about the Civil War, which is great. I didn't know that much, and I, I kind of knew this, but as I was reading this biography, it was just so eye-opening to me to read about how people who were slave owners viewed themselves as far as their faith in God. They thought they were doing exactly what God wanted them to do. 
These were the religious people of the days. There, there's this tension, was a tension built on this idea, this evil idea that some humans, based on the pigment of their skin, were less human than others, it, which is bad enough, but the, the really bad thing about the people who held this view is that the people who owned slaves, they built, believed that their actions were totally blessed by God. Totally God-ordained actions. They, they were fighting for God, they thought. These were holy actions. And that someone like Abraham Lincoln, who was willing to fight on behalf of freeing the, the, the slaves, he was seen as a kind of enemy to God. And now in the 21st century, we look at that and we go, how could that be? But that is what the reality was. It, it was a dark world. It was a dark situation. It is a dark world. And, and friends, we live in this dark world where the sin that so easily entangles the hearts of nations, of movements, can also just as easily entangle your heart and my heart. And when someone like a Lincoln arises, or in our text, even more perfectly, let's look at Jesus. When someone like Jesus arises, when pure love itself comes and takes a stand, we live in a world that so often can't see it, and in a world that pushes against it, which should cause us to pause and just ask ourselves an honest question. Like, does the world that I operate in love or hate me? Now, we shouldn't make it our goal to be hated. <laughs> it's probably not a good idea. But as a follower of Jesus, as you walk around and you live your life in this world that is so dark so often, do you just find yourself fitting in easily? The world has no problem with you. The world never questions anything about you. I mean, does the world in which I operate blindly accept me as one of their own? Do I easily fit into the world's pattern or into the world's mold? Because if you are a follower of Jesus, it's not that every moment of every day should be a challenge, but if you're not facing some kind of pushback on some level if, but from the world in some way as you operate in your day-to-day -day life, it should cause us to pause and just ask about our own relationship with God. Like, am I really living it out? Am, am I really just being transparent with people about this connection that I have to the vine with Jesus? Because if we're connected to the vine, then we're conduits of God's love in the world. And sometimes we stop and we ask, well, why doesn't God fix this dark world that we live in? And, and first and foremost, he did through Jesus. But secondly, he wants to through you. And as you start to trust him and take those steps, you might find all kinds of pushback in the world. He wants to do something about this darkness, and he wants to do it through you. And if you stay connected to him, here's the second thing that will happen this morning. You'll find that his experience is also your experience. Or you'll find that your experience is the same as his experience. This is exactly what Jesus goes on to say. It's the next two kind of if statements that he says. He says, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Now, we've already kind of laid the groundwork for knowing that the world in its darkness was against the bringer of peace and love and joy and light. But have you ever wondered why? I want you to think about Jesus' world for a moment. Who, who were the groups of people in Jesus' world? It was the Jews and it was the Gentiles. And who were the Jews? They were the people of God. They, Jesus was a Jewish man. These were the religious people of his day. These were God's people. These were the people of love the people of light. And so to hear a man come into the religious uh, situation of their day and say that your deeds are actually darkness. I know you call yourself a person of light, but your deeds are actually darkness, and your love has actually nothing to do with God was a horrible offense. Nicodemus was one of the just rare religious people who was actually willing to say, you know what, he might be right, and to come and ask Jesus about that. So to put it simply, Jesus ticked off a lot of religious people when he came into the world. He's just constantly ticking off religious people. And who were the Gentiles? The Gentiles were everybody else. It was just this normal cultural people living in the Roman Empire 
who, who held a loyalty to Caesar, who would bow a knee and burn incense, incense to Caesar. And these Christians, led by Jesus, wouldn't do any of that. These Romans would enforce peace with a sword. They would keep the peace by killing people. They'd enforce peace by death and by war if necessary. And this is just the way the politics of their day was. In fact, it's the way the politics of our day is as well. And Jesus came and lived in a different way. He spoke of an eternal peace that's fueled by 100% pure love. To put it simply, Jesus ticked off a lot of good, normal, non-religious people, too, didn't he? He ticked off most of the religious people, and he ticked off most of the non-religious people. I just think that's interesting. Because his way didn't really fit into a religious checkbox, did it? It it didn't fit into a neat political party. He would have ran a, a terrible political movement. Because no religion of the world and no political party has ever been born out of pure love for God. And so Jesus' followers were learning to see past all of the cultural garbage that they get into, whether it be religious or non-religious, and the sin that we carry as humans, and to see people through God's eyes. To see people the way that God sees people, whether they're religious or non-religious, political or apolitical. And if his experience is supposed to be our experience, where he lives a kind of separate and holy life in the world, I can say that we have a long way to go with this because most of our motivations and most of our allegiances are totally influenced by the world, and I can absolutely prove it to you. So go ahead and put up the next slide. Go Bears. For those of you who are online, there's a visceral reaction in the room to the Bears. Now, there's a few Bears fan in here, I know, but the next one is even better, you guys. Remember 2016? What a great year. Oh, huge year. Go Cubbies, you guys. Go Cubbies. Yeah, we got one Cubbies. <laughs> all right, let's get all that garbage off the screen. Go ahead and put the next one up. That's better. That's better. Okay, we're good. Now, yeah. <laughs> go Pack Go. Let's, let's get real. But... Now, for some of you, that meant nothing. I get it. Uh, My wife, uh, she would have felt absolutely nothing, any of those. She's not interested. But for a lot of us in the room, just the idea of, like, rooting for the bears or the cubs just made you feel sick. It makes me feel sick, you guys. I'll be honest with you. But what it proves to you is that there's something about you that is so tied to culture. Your allegiances aren't just to Jesus, are they? You've got deep allegiances. How many of you, when you go to a Packers game or you go to a Brewers game or you go to any sort of event or maybe it's a concert, you know what I do when I go to every concert? Arms up in the air, cheering, singing along, right? Everybody. Because it's a powerful allegiances. You see, we judge and we hate certain things that don't go along with our allegiances. We judge and we hate each other. We just do it privately. We've just learned not to say it out loud. We just jump to conclusions because we wear the most important parts about us out on our sleeves. We, we, we put it out here for the world to see, right? And we, when we see something in other people that we don't like, how quickly do we hate it? How quickly do we push against it? And friends, I guess my question for you with that is, do you wear Jesus on your sleeve? Is he out there on the the front of your life, on the forefront? Is is he in the public part of your life? Do people see it? Do they see that you're connected to him? Live in love, he says. He, He prefaces this whole section by saying, live in love, he tells us. And how much of his love do you allow others to see? Because Jesus says, I've lived within the perfect love of God. And if they persecuted me because of it, they will persecute you because of it as well. If they treat you this way, just know that they don't even know the one who sent you. That's his word to you this morning about himself. And so the question at this point isn't simply, does the world love or hate me? But it's how does the world treat me? Because you might not know if the world loves or hates you, 
but you can tell a lot by how people treat you, right? By how they treat you. Does it treat me as one of its own? Or does it treat me as a follower of Jesus, the Messiah? Because here's the reality, and it's our third point for today. There is always a price to pay. There's always a price to pay. There's always a price to pay for any relationship that we're in with people and with God, for the connection that we choose to have or that we choose not to have. Jesus puts it this way in verses 22 to 24. He says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. And if I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law, that they hated me without reason. Let's be brutally honest today. Why do so many of us reject Jesus' presence in our life? And you might be saying, hey, I'm a Christian. What do you mean I reject his presence? I think that most of us accept his presence in our life most of the time. But I think we, a lot of us make specific decisions to reject his presence at specific moments of our life when it's convenient for us to reject him or to act like, yeah, it's just not at the forefront of my life. It's over here. Why do we disconnect from the vine, in other words? Why, when we can plainly see that he's our connection to God, he's the connection to the source of God's love, why do we choose lesser loves to identify with? Because here's the verdict from Jesus, that when presented with love, we as a humanity, by and large, have rejected that love. And when we reject his love, there is always a price to pay we so often think that we're choosing like this kind of a neutral ground when we reject God in our daily lives and in our interactions. But there's a cost to rejecting the source of life in our own life. Jesus came to, and he said, I came, I showed you the Father's heart, and you rejected it. You rejected it. It, it reminds me of the southwest region of the U.S. You can go to the next uh, slide. It relies on the Colorado River. Beautiful, right? Some of you have probably seen the Colorado River. But the whole southwestern part of the U.S. relies on this river to give it water, which is obviously very important. Everybody needs water. It's the life source of everything. And there are now 40 million plus Americans living in the desert, all relying on the Colorado River. Now, there's water underground too, but it's drying up, and the Colorado River sometimes has a good year, but it's drying up year after year after year. And the question has been asked by many, what will we do when we no longer have water in the desert? How will we live here if we don't have water in the desert? Where will we go? We have to go somewhere. And friends, this is what you are as a follower of Jesus because this is who Jesus is. He's like an oasis or a river flowing through the desert. And you, as being connected to him, that's what you are. You're like, like a fresh, you're a refreshment to the people around you. You're like a river flowing through the dry places in our world. And Jesus is saying, what's going to happen if they reject their one source of life? Who else are they going to go to if they reject me? What will happen? And when we do it, it always costs us. We always have to pay a cost. And so often we think of our rejection of God will bring us freedom, but it actually enslaves us to a self-centered delusion, uh, delusions which do not have God and his love as their source in the first pr place. There's always a price to pay when re we reject God's truth. When we reject Jesus, we reject, we reject our only conduit into relationship with God. And so I just wonder what the cost is for you this morning. The cost of following Jesus, yes, but also the cost of not following him. Because Jesus is showing us that there's plenty of people in this world who reject him they push him aside, and they just get on with their lives. They just don't think about it, right? You know, Sunday morning is like a really great time for brunch. Have you noticed? 
that it's a really great time for sleeping in. I don't speak as a person with experience, but I hear that it's great for sleeping in. It's a nice time to sit on the porch and drink coffee, I assume. I mean, can we just be honest? Sunday morning seems like a great time to be a lot of other places than here, does it not? But it's not just Sunday morning, it's our whole lives. Every moment we get to, where we get to call the shots of our own lives, it seems incredibly alluring. Every moment where we're in charge and nobody can tell us what to do seems totally normal in our world. Being disconnected from God, it has its appeals, doesn't it? But friends, here's the question. What will that disconnection from God cost you? What is it costing you when you disconnect from God? I I found in my own life that the more that I get what I want, the less vibrancy I have in my life. I just kind of become this more dead person the more that I get what I want. The more I focus on my own needs and fulfilling them, the less that I'm living this kind of like full of energy, full of life, full of love kind of a life. The more that I think I'm getting ahead and doing life on my own, the less I actually experience God. Because disconnection from God always comes at a cost, and we can pretend that it doesn't. But at some point, we will realize that we're like a city in the desert who's had the water turned off. We can't last long apart from the source of life. So, following Jesus, it's going to cost you. Jesus says the world might hate you. You might have all sorts of things pushing against you, but it's going to cost you of the things that maybe you shouldn't be holding on to in the first place. It's going to cost you possibly your depression. It might. It, it might cost you your pride following Jesus. It might. It, it, relationship with God, it might cost you your hopelessness. It's hard to be hopeless when you're focused on what Jesus has done for you. It might cost you your pain. Relationship with God, it's not going to magically fix all that in a snap of a finger, right? It's not like some magic thing, but it'll put the sin and the pain in your life in its proper place. You'll finally be able to see it for what it is. And it might cost you those things. You might not be able to interact with those things anymore. And so friends, here's our big idea this morning. It's that relationship with God is simply worth the cost. It is. It's worth the cost. It's worth the rejection of the world. It's worth the time and the energy that it takes to keep up a relationship with him. It just takes time and energy. uh, The energy it takes to connect with God daily, it's worth centering your life on. This life that Jesus offers us that's in direct connection to God, it is worth every single moment of your life. It just is. No moment is wasted in your relationship with him. You can waste all kinds of time with God, but if it's with God, none of it's wasted. None of it's wasted. He will use it all. So what are you waiting for is the question. What are you waiting for? What is God speaking to you, and where does he want you to take a step right now at this moment of your life? Let's pray about that together. God, we love the way that you speak to to us, you engage with us, you interact with us, if we're willing to listen. If we're willing to listen. God, we come here this morning simply acknowledging that so often we don't listen. And we walk out in a world that doesn't listen, God. Would you change us? Do you give us hearts and minds that are interested in you, in what you have to say? God, change our, our motivations and the things that we love to be the things that you love. Change our eyes so we can see the world the way that you see the world, so that our lives might be different, and so that tomorrow would be marked by your presence in our life, God. So we pray these things. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Amen.